Welcome to Book Talk. And this is your host, Anthony Moirore. And at Book Talk, as you know, we always get to have an author come and tell us about his book or her book. And today we are very blessed to have with us one great person. And his name is known as Sylvester Boyd. And I hope I got that right. Correct. Okay. And uh, Sylvester Boyd is an author. He's an actor, he's a historian, and he's also a motivational speaker. Now, I'm surprised that uh, you will guess how old Sylvester is. He doesn't look it a bit. I was surprised, and I just have to speak this as we are beginning. He's seen it all. He's been there and done that, been all over the world and accomplished so many things. And uh, even before we go and talk about his book or his books, because they are books. Let's get to know a bit about uh, Sylvester. Welcome to the show, Sylvester. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Yes, and uh, let, let's begin by when you were born. This is interesting. Well, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Yeah. In the year 1943. 1943. In the, in the middle of World War II. So okay, okay. I have an idea of my age from that. Uh, okay, <laughs> I see. 1943. That's not yesterday. <laughs> no, it's not yesterday. I wished it was, but it's not. Uh, that, that, that's wonderful. I was saying I need to have genes like yours to be uh, looking just quite as young when I, I have quite some great experiences. Well, I hope you do. Yeah, it, yeah it's my prayer. So uh, tell us a bit about your you growing up and in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Okay, well, I, I was born and raised, as I alluded to earlier, in the city of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, in the Cook County Hospital here. Uh, when I went to uh, elementary school, it was all, of course, in a black community. And all of my friends and neighbors were, at that time, mostly African Americans. And I didn't even see many white people at that point in time. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, 12 years old, my family moved from the... Uh, uh, into the uh, inner city housing project, yeah. which was located near Chinatown, near 22nd and Whitworth in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I had many, I had many Asian friends, and uh, I, at that time there was a very mixed community. We had Asian, Puerto Rican, Me Mexicans, uh, just a whole host of people, naturally African Americans. And so I call that that community my little UN community because it had it had a little of everyone in it. Okay. And, at the age of 15, my folks only stayed in the public housing for two years because my stepfather um, built a house in Michigan. My mother bought 40 acres of land, uh -huh. and she lived there until she died at the age of 89. Uh -huh. And that, I went to an all-white high school, predominantly white high school, about 95% white. So uh, I've had in my background, uh, you know, I've lived with all different uh, groups growing up. And uh, that gave me a, a different perspective on the world that most people never get to live with in school, uh, the, you know, being an all African American community and a mixed community than an all white community. So by the time I was a uh, graduate from high school, I had a, a very diverse background and understood a lot of different cultures, which was a, a part of an education in itself. Mm -hmm. Not just my formal education, but my background and the way I was raised was part of a uh, uh, who I became in, in the long run. I learned uh, different uh, people have different ways of being, but I found out that we've all, we're, we're all variations on the same thing. Okay. We're all human. And so mm -hmm. that uh, has influenced me the rest of my life. Uh, give you a little background. My, uh, my aunt, who the, my books are based on, yeah. she went from the cotton fields of Mississippi, mm -hmm. the deep south, in the, in the early 20th century to a millionaire when she, when she uh, passed away. Okay. So that, that was what my story in my book is based on her life. Uh -huh. Journey through time. And the first book opens up down south and it's basically in the south of the U.S. Uh, yeah. under, under trying conditions. Uh, it opens up with a scene of her in a horse and buggy, mule drawn and whack. So you yeah. can see how far that goes back. Yeah. Uh, the story is also based on the stories told to me by my relatives. My grandmother okay. was born back in the 1800s. So, uh, and then my great grandfather, who I met, 
who is in the book as well, yeah. is born in the, uh, just after slavery, a few years after slavery. So, mm. uh, and I actually have had contact with all those people. So I was connected with all those different people living in all those different time periods. Uh, when I uh, wrote the book, when my upon my aunt's death, I figured, hey, this is a great story, and if I don't tell it, who is going to tell it? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I didn't. I'm not a former writer or anything. I sat down and said, I'm going to do it because I was all taught if you, if, if my mother used to always say, if somebody else has done it, you can do it too. Yeah. So, you know, so I sit, I sit to, I put pen to paper, yeah. and I'm now uh, at my working on my fourth book in the series. The yeah. book has been a the book was awarded a five star rating. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been it's award winning, and I just sat down and did it. Uh, but the story is very interesting, and uh, the it everybody that reads it loves it. Uh, ah. it it's not just one book; it's four, it's, it's three at the present time. Okay, and the series, the book is known as "The Road from Money." The Road from Money. Can you explain to us a bit that title about the title? Oh, that, that always, I did that on purpose. Matter okay. of fact, my, my wife gave me that title. Yeah. Uh, the, because money, people think financial, you know, uh, you know, coins and dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. But it's not about that. It's about money, Mississippi. Okay. It's, it's a small town that sits on the Tallahatchie River in the Mississippi Delta of the United States. Okay. And uh, it, it was where Emmett Till, I don't know whether you're familiar with him, but Emmett Till was killed and thrown in the Tallahatchie River in the year 1955. Yeah. Uh, my folks were all from there. Mm -hmm. That was the town that kicked off the spark for the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. That was before Martin Luther King. That mm -hmm. was before Rosa Parks. So really, my folks came from a town that actually started the Civil Rights Movement in the United States. Okay. My name is Mississippi. Okay. That's, so money is a place. It's not the, the cash that we know. Right, right. And so I, I did that purposely to make it draw a yeah. little interest. So I was wondering when you say the road from money, when all the, pe the, other, the people in the world want to know the road to money. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, this is the road from money, not the road to money. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And it's from and from money to where? Tell us. She, well, she went uh, from money. She left it uh, as most African-Americans, because this is historical too. Yeah follow this book, you're not just following her life, mm -hmm. you're, following, you're following the history of African Americans in America. Quite okay. Bit. So uh, when she she was a young child, she was, you know, in, in, in the South, she picked cotton, you know, and all of that type of thing. And then, as most African Americans did, they were mistreated. Mm -hmm. and, and so they wanted to get away from that type of strict mistreatment. So yeah. they, they migrated to the north. Okay. So in my book, it talks about the journey on the train from money to uh -huh. Chicago, where okay. she settled and lived all of the rest of her life. Uh -huh. uh, she uh, basically followed the same tracks that many other African Americans. Some went north, uh, most most went north, but a lot went south, uh -huh. uh, uh, southwest rather. I won't say south southwest. And some went to California west, and some went all the way to Canada. Uh -huh. Basically, to get to get away from the oppressive conditions okay. that the South was in the United States for African Americans. Uh -huh. uh, so it's a historical perspective on, on, on not only my aunt, yeah. but on uh, the a people, the African American people. And uh -huh. I thought it was very interesting. It, it parallels, it brings in, uh, it talks about, uh, the mood, it starts with a mule drawn wagon coming into the town of Money, Mississippi along the Tallahassee River. And uh, I haven't ended it yet, but uh, at the year 1968 is where the, the last book that has been published ends in the year 1968 with uh, the death of Martin King and uh, Bobby Kennedy. So that was a real trying year, but it, it, that's where it's progressed to now. And the book I'm working on now, the fourth book in, in the series, yeah. uh, is, it will be published, I hope the first of next year, the spring of the year. And uh, that'll be the fourth and final book in the series. And it will take you to the end of her life. In, in 2009, she passed away at the age of 91. Oh, I, I can see. And I can tell that your family or your tribe has good genes. If she died at 91. Yeah, well, I had an uncle who died at 100, 
I had, a, I, had a, I had one of my relatives died at 104. Okay, that's wonderful. Yeah. So when was the book first book uh, written? In which year? It was written in the uh, year 2014. 2014, 2014. And yes. okay, and uh, now what exactly triggered you to say now this is what, uh, this is the time, this is what I have to put down and uh, I have to. Well, basically when she passed away, I said, look, you know, she lived a heck of a life, it was uh -huh. a, a, a heck of a journey. She was a very intelligent well, uh, woman, but then that my whole family, I was been very blessed to have a, a very smart group of relatives, I'll put mm -hmm. it that way. Yeah. And what I became came from them. Okay. Uh, I stand on their shoulders. I understand that very clearly that they passed on certain things to me yeah. that uh, was uh, very, very, uh, let's say, instrumental in my life. Mm -hmm. The thing they told me, the thing they taught me, the thing they showed me. Uh, I've been a teacher and I know that quite a few of our young people don't get that type of uh, uh, parental and, and family bonding that I had. Mm. My family uh, was quite an extensive family. If I didn't like what my mother said, I went to my grandmother. And if I didn't like what my grandmother said, mm. I went to my uncle. If I did. So I just had an extensive family with like a big blanket of love thrown around me. So that translates into me. If, if you get love, you know how to love. Sometimes if you don't get love, you don't know how to yeah, that's so sort of part of my uh, experience with life. Uh -huh. uh, basically, uh, my folks, uh, I have a uh, one uh, get, getting away a little bit from me and my aunt. I have one nephew at this point in time. He mm -hmm. is uh, in he has a PhD in biochemistry. He works okay. for the United States government. Mm -hmm. I have another I have another nephew that speaks four languages, including Farsi. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I mean, my family is very because we were taught. Education is the key to the door. And if you don't get the education, you can't open the door. That's that, that's what I was taught. And oh. my family all raised like that. Oh. Uh, my mother, my brother, my mother raised uh, there were seven of us. Uh-huh. And there's only two of us that didn't graduate from college out of seven. And uh, I have nieces and nephews that all graduated from college. So it, you know, we it's just what the family does. We do this. We we get our education and then we go out to challenge the world. Oh. We talk from a long, a long, long time. Uh, all my life, I've heard certain things that you do. Uh, don't wait for life to come to you. You go get life. That's wonderful. If you, want, if you if you if you want something, you have to reach for it. If you don't yeah. reach for it, you can't. You, you won't receive it a lot. So I mean, those are the mottos, and and, and they're little things that most people I, I take for granted. And my wife says a lot of times to me, she says, "You take that for granted," but a lot of people never heard that. Your whole yeah. They never give type of thing. So I think that's what makes us a, 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 a strong family. It's what I wanted to write about it. Uh, my aunt, you know, I'm not going to tell you what all happened to all the books, but my aunt actually stood on the Great Wall of China and she traveled the world extensively. Now my love of traveling came from her. She went from she went to plays and she went to you know the King and I and she was a very uh, I won't say. Uh, very cultured lady. She she uh, would teach you things that you know, sort of the upper class or whatever. Which she would she would always be there. My grandmother had a sixth grade education. Uh huh. She had her in the sixth grade, but she was just one of the smartest people I ever know. I always say she had a PhD in common sense. Common sense. She would say things like, uh, "If you plant a crooked seed, you get a crooked plant." <laughs> which then will bear crooked fruit. Now, if you now me being a historian uh -huh. and, and seeing what's going on with the world, racism in America yeah. was a crooked seed. Uh -huh. it, then a crooked plant came up. Yeah. And now we are tasting the crooked fruit. So sure. you, you saw I, I did an overlay on things like that. Yeah. You, know, you know, that it, it, I, I put it, I put her words into what it meant in a historical perspective to me. Yeah, and that's quite wonderful. And I see they passed so many good things to you that you've been experiencing over the years. Uh, we said in the beginning that you are an actor and you've appeared in many places, in many TV shows, in films. And uh, someone watching this uh, 
uh, talk, this show, could uh, just identify, and I think this man looks familiar. So if you are watching there, uh, our guest today has been on many of them. Some of them I may not mention, but he's been on Batman and Superman, Shameless. Some, some he may have just been uh, appearing as a, 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 sub, a support, or I don't know the right term that you use it in film industry, but you've been uh, at, uh, with, in the Bose, APB, Electric Dreams, Captive State, uh, Windows, or Windows, Crisis, The Exorcist, uh, uh, Chicago Justice, Lovecraft Country, Proven Innocent, in Sense8, and I can't finish the list. He may add some more uh, prominent uh, films that he's been on. Yeah, well, my going into uh, you know, kind of switching subjects here, uh, going into uh, acting was just, I was discovered. Yeah. I was walking down the street. I live here in Chicago, downtown. Okay. And, and uh, one day I was, didn't have a lot to do. So I said, I go downtown and grab me a little lunch. And uh, on the way to my lunch, there was a gentleman who says, you need to be in the movies. Uh -huh. And of course, I'm saying, what this crackpot, you know, what, what's up with this guy? You know, you, you, when somebody approaches you that way, you, you know, you think he's a crackpot, basically, the first thing you think. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, he said, no, we're looking for extras or background people for movies. Yeah. And he gave me a sheet of paper and I looked at it and I said, I don't know, this is legit. Or what is, you know, what's this? But he said, if you come down to uh, the, uh, uh, North side tomorrow, we're going to be taking applications for people who we'd like to maybe think be in, in, in the, in the uh, movie uh -huh. that's coming up. So I'm saying, okay, the next day I didn't have a lot to do. And yeah. that, you know, so I said, okay, what the heck? I, I got a little time on my hands. Let me go ahead and see what this is all about. Uh -huh. So I went up north where they, and I got this. Oh, God, I'm not going to get in this. This is, uh, they had all kinds of people. If you ever seen the America's Got Talent or something like that. Yeah, uh, it was looked like a thousand people uh -huh. to, to be in, in the movie. Okay. Okay. You know, it was tall people, black people, white people, fat people, skinny people, old people, young people, every, every uh, nomination you could think of. Uh -huh. So I, I looked and I said, okay, I got a chance of being in this. I'm sure, I'm just wasting my time. <laughs> so I filled out some paperwork, went home. Okay. And, about two weeks later, two to three weeks later, I can't remember exactly the time, man, the phone rang. Uh -huh. it, it, it was a casting company. Uh -huh. And they said, we have given you a part in the motion picture, The Dilemma, with Vince Vaughn, Queen Latifah, uh, Kevin James, uh, Renona Ryder, uh -huh. Jennifer Connelly, some of the biggest Hollywood stars. At the okay. time. You know, it just, it was that simple. That's the way I got into being a background actor. Background oh. actors are the extras. The people you see in the background, I always say we've seen, but we're not seen. Yeah. You know, we're, we're the people that, if you're in a crowd theater, you got to have somebody, the foreground actor, the big star, they up front in the camera. But we're the people that's crossing the streets, or if we're in a crowded theater, we're the people that, uh, you know, that make the scene go there. If you're in a baseball stadium, we're the people that are yelling uh, in the background. So you see us all the time. Any program that you look at, that uh, very, very few just have the, the main stars. The background mm -hmm. actors actually make the, the scene. We actually bring the, we bring to life the actors. That's what we're taught to do. And you know that film could not be complete without you. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> well, not, not me per se, but when you look at TV, I hope people start to look at, you know, yeah. people talking the street. Those, nobody that you see on that camera is just incidental. They can't yeah. take pictures of people in just general public. They they, be they be so anybody that's in front of that camera, when you see a scene, is, is an actor. Yeah, 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 yeah. From the background to the foreground. Uh -huh. Some of the people I've, you know, I've been in, in movies with Forrest Whitaker. Uh -huh. uh, like I mentioned, Vince Vaughn. Yeah. Uh, Nona Ryder, Kevin James. Uh, some of the biggest actors in, in Hollywood. I mean, just the people who have received Academy Awards. I've been on set with them. Ah. So the people who have received the uh, uh, Emmys and Grammys, I've been on set with them. Ah. So, and so it's very interesting. 
They don't get paid the money they get paid. I wish they did. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's very interesting. I get a chance to go places. I've been in the Chicago Bears locker room. I've been in Michael Jordan's locker room. Mm -hmm. um, you know, places that general public would never get a chance to go. Yeah. I've been, I've been at the Opera House in Chicago and in, in the dressing room, uh, you know, uh, and see all the background uh, uh, things that go on behind the camera. Mm -hmm. And I know how I know how movies are made from yeah. start to print, finish. So, uh, you know, that, it's been very, very interesting. It, it's a dynamic uh, business. It, it changes all the time. Uh, in, in the United States, there's only three major cities that do uh, movies. Los Angeles, Hollywood, of course. Yeah. And you have uh, Tyler Perry. He's in, he's located in, in the South, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And you, you have New York City. They shoot quite a few. And then Chicago, here recently, has become a, a, a mecca of a movie maker where I'm based at. So uh, it, it's a very interesting business. And I can bet that over the years you experienced quite a lot of transformation from, <laughs> from the early ages and all the, 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 the digital world uh, that has come in. I mean, you've seen everything and everything. It, yeah, it changes uh, constantly. Matter of fact, in Chicago, I hear that they're going to build uh, a back lot, something like down in Hollywood. So mm. they got a big, a big place uh, on the uh, west side of Chicago, I think, in the, in the start, where you actually can go in like a Disney World type thing, where you actually see where the, the, where the public can come in and view how food movies are made. So that's coming. And okay. there's a couple of other things that's very interesting. Chicago is becoming a mecca of, of motion pictures. Uh, we are waiting to see uh, what other changes are going to take place as we continue to experience. And uh, there was a break uh, due to the pandemic, but uh, you're still going on and moving on. And uh, before we came on uh, and show, you had told me that you have a set tomorrow. So you're still moving on, acting. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be, matter of fact, tomorrow this time, probably I'll be in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a new series, Michael B. Jordan is directing it, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a, a, a chance that I'll be here around this time tomorrow. I'll be in front of the camera in a show called 61st Street. Okay. It won't air into 2022. So this is some of the first scenes that will be shot uh, for uh, the, the upcoming uh, series. There's a TV series called 61st Street. Okay. First, referring to 61st Street here in Chicago. So it's, I'm looking forward to doing that work. Uh, Courtney Vance is also in it. He's a major star. I've also been in, in a movie called Lovecraft Country, which also included Courtney Vance. Mm. Uh, if, if anybody saw the picture Hidden Figures, uh, it starred Taraji P. Hinton. I've been on set with her many times. Uh, I was in the uh, program Empire for about 22 different times. So in the background, not in the forward, but in some, I'm in Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, uh, some of the major, that's an NBC series that is number one in the ratings. And when Empire was on for a time, it was number one in the ratings. So I was on number one uh, TV program. Uh, it, it's an interesting place to be. Like I said before, I alluded to before, uh, People get this, they say, well, you look familiar, but they don't, I'm not the big star. So <laughs> but they, they see me enough in the background sometimes that they, they, they don't just get where they saw me at, but they know they, my face looks familiar. Yeah, I understand. So uh, let's go back to the books and the series. I believe each and every one of the books has a message a main theme maybe that you want to portray to the public and you want us to get their lessons, maybe the history or maybe uh, a life lesson because I like uh, myself looking at life lessons. So I'm always interested in books that teach me something new. And you can, uh, you can bring us what your aunt uh, experienced, what she passed on to you through her story uh, tell us a bit more about the breakdown of the books. Okay, well, the book, I can, I can give you a quick uh, synopsis of the books. Mm -hmm. uh, the books ran, the birth book started in the year 1925. She was born in, 19, uh, in, in uh, 1917. Yeah. 1917-18 was, uh, was uh, if, it, if you know history a little bit, was World War I. Mm -hmm. 
my grandfather and some of the other people were in soldiers in World War One. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line there was that she was born right at the turn of the century. You know, cars were just getting, you know, automobiles. People were just, to have a car was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, airplanes, you know, they were scaring people when they were, she said she looked up one time in the cotton field and said that she just scared her because an airplane went over because that was new. Yeah. If you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, this was just about the time radio came out a few years ago. So she, that part of, of history is very interesting too because there's a lot of inventions. We think now the internet and all of that. If you think back a little bit, you know, the automobile, we take that for granted. Well, mm -hmm. that's a, a part of the time that she came up in as her childhood. Uh, airplane, you know, we take getting on an airplane for granted these days. Right? Yeah. That, was, that was something people didn't do back then. They, yeah. they uh, and uh, they were trains, and that was a big deal. Uh, she got the, the news uh, of better conditions in the north because the train was stopped. Uh, the Chicago Defender, I believe, would the train, the porters would drop off the Defender paper uh, when they came from Chicago down south. So the people down south started to say, hey, they're living a lot better up there mm -hmm. than, than we are here. So as she went, like most Black people, they didn't like the conditions in the South. Who wants to, they weren't, they were treated abominably, let's put it that way. Okay. So they, they wanted to escape. Anybody who's being oppressed would not like to be oppressed. So there was a thing called the Great Migration North, and she was part of that. She arrived in the city uh, of Chicago in the year 1937, uh -huh. uh, just before World War II. That would have been time just before World War II. Yeah. But the first book covers her in the South. It's set totally in the South. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, it, it was about uh, the people in the South, the way they did things, uh, uh, the customs in the South, uh, you know, and it wasn't all bad. I mean, it was mostly bad, but they were, they would go on picnics and they would have uh, hay rides and field days and they would go swimming in the river and all those. So those is covered some of that also. Mm -hmm. But it, she arrived in Chicago. The second book talks, it goes from the year 1920. 1937 is where the second book starts. At. Okay. And it it, it uh, includes uh, World War II. She was uh, uh, worked in a defense plant, actually mm -hmm. making parts for airplanes during World War II. So she was kind of Rosalie Riveter in World War II. Okay. Uh, it also encompasses uh, something they did that was very interesting. They went to various churches. They went to a Catholic church. They went to, now she was Baptist. It was some girls from the defense plant, and this was before integration and all of that. She made friends with several people. One was a, 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 a white woman, two uh -huh. white, white women. And then there was a woman who was Mexican descent uh -huh. and herself, and they decided to go to each other's churches, which that's just described in the book. So we touch on religious customs and tradition there. Okay. Uh, she was Rosie the Riveter, so we talked about her, her employment there. She married, the reason she could get ahead in her time in her life, her husband, uh, my uncle Sidney, he looked like a white man. Uh -huh. And so he was able to do things that she would never be able to do at that time in America. Okay. And she, she, so they bought, she married him and they bought an apartment bill. Yeah. And he died at several years later. I think they were married 11 years. And when he passed away, she she became in possession of the building herself. Mm -hmm. in then she got she got a break and uh, so she got another chance the opportunity to buy another building. And so she built her wealth on the apartment building. She was in the real estate game. Uh -huh. And but she never stopped working. She also had employment where she went to work every day, but she just saved her checks. The way she really got ahead is that the, the buildings were enough for her to take care of herself and to, you know, do the things that she wanted to do and pay her bills. Mm -hmm. But her checks, she would just save them. She'd get paid and she put the checks in the bank. So they go directly into the bank and so the money piled up. Okay. So she really the uh, sort of middle, middle class, lower, upper class life. Uh -huh. She went to plays. And so uh, I was her nephew. And she had no kids. Mm -hmm. She basically took me under when well, she really wanted to, to adopt me, but my mother wouldn't let her. So, so uh, she uh, 
did the next best thing. In the summer, I spent the summers at her house here in Chicago. Uh, she had a big backyard and, 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 and all of those things. That, and so I was like an only child in a way. Okay. Although my mother would they get to arguing, my mother would say, that's my child, it ain't yours. <laughs> but, you know, uh, my mother had several other kids. We, I had seven uh, siblings. So I was glad to get to, to go to my aunt's house on the weekend and get away from my siblings, so to speak. Uh, I was the oldest. Okay. And, um, therefore, it was like, a, you know, I had the privilege of being the oldest and, and going to my aunt's house on the weekend. When I got to school on Friday night, I didn't see my mother's house till Sunday afternoon. So every weekend I would spend with her. Uh -huh. And we would go with, to her, with her to pick the upper rent. And to uh, and then we'd go downtown and we'd see plays. And I got what I wanted. If I pointed it out, I would say, I want that. And you know, she'd give it to me. And she said, you're spoiled or something. And my grandmother was lived with her. So, uh -huh. uh, so I had the love of my grandmother, too. And the story that, that I wrote came a lot from my grandmother. She only had a sixth grade education. Yeah. But I think she had a PhD in common sense. Uh -huh. so the, the things that uh, little things that she would say and do stuck with me to the rest of my life. And sometimes I didn't understand them back in those days. And I'll find myself at, as old as I am now saying, you know, that's what she meant. It, it just it, it hits me. It dawns on me. Oh, and so she was very smart. Okay. And I think that's another thing we can learn that every individual on earth is connected to the next in some odd way yeah and that we are all homo sapiens uh -huh. and no matter what the skin color no matter what the religion no matter what the custom no matter what the food we're all human beings yeah but for some reason we have a, a tendency to emphasize our differences and kind of minimize uh, uh you know how we alike we don't want to you know we want to be different we want to separate we want to uh -huh figure out that we're better than the next guy somewhere or other. He's, he, he or she uh, is not as good as me for whatever the reason it is. And I think that's one of man's biggest failures. That, that's causing the problem, uh, getting into a political dynamic right now, that we have in America right now. We have people who believe that the old way of taking people and making them feel inferior and other people making themselves feel superior is a good way. That, Which only is a leads, that only leads to problems. Yeah. It always has history. It always will. Being a historian, I can see many parallels between what happened in Nazi Germany uh -huh. and where we are today. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, this person, this group against that group. Yeah. And I think somewhere along the uh, line, someone said in a statement, a house divided against itself. Cannot stand. Can not stand. Yeah, that's and true. I think, and I think we're a house divided in America against itself. And I'm very afraid of where our democracy is at this point. Being a historian, I feel that we're kind of where Nazi Germany was. You know, there's a lot of people that fought Adolf Hitler, but they ended up in, 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 in a bad place, a very bad place. Yeah. And many, millions of people died because they followed and went down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. I didn't convince them that at that point, <laughs> that was the wrong path. It started with the brown shirts and it ended up with uh, tragedies. So, uh, you know, knowing history, I love history because most people think history is just a bunch of places, times, and dates. No, your history, what you did 10 minutes ago is history in your life. Yeah, exactly. And everything and it's important. Right. And not only that, everything has history. Yeah. You, could, yeah. you can say the history of the automobile. Mm hmm you can say the history of uh, seagoing creatures. Exactly. Okay. Everything has a history. And, and people don't realize. They think, well, I'm, to this day in my life, I have never used the algebra I learned in high school. Never uh, used it. I used the geometry. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, we we uh, everything is put into maybe something that people don't use as much. The common values. How do you how do you make out a checkbook? My kids are not taught that. How, mm -hmm. do, you, how do you invest in the stock market? Yeah, you know, I mean, those things that really would affect people's lives are not taught. Not, I was, I've been a teacher, so I know. And uh, basically, you know, we should teach our educational system is, to me, history is taught wrong. We leave out a lot of what different groups do. Mm -hmm. You know, what did the American Indian do? The first people in America was not Christopher Columbus. Yeah. That's a, that's a lie. 
So uh -huh. based a lot of our history on lies and, and omissions to make a one group feel better than the other. Uh -huh. And you know, if I'm taught a lie and I don't know any better, I'm gonna believe a lie. You're gonna believe and a lie and you are going to you are going to live with a lie. And this is why we have you now, for example, and your the people of your times who come and tell us what exactly was there and was happening and uh, what we can do today to avoid the mistakes of the future. And uh, that's important. And thank you for writing even the books and uh, telling us some history that we can look back to. You know, history, history is very, 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 very important. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not, we're not, like I said, it, we could correct a lot of our problems today if we just taught true history. Yeah. My, my grandmother, going back to one of her hotels, she said, you can't get the truth from a lie and you can't get a lie from the truth. I mean, if, if you look at it, yeah. if you tell a lie, you can't get the truth from it. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's, there's no, and she said, you tell one lie, you gotta, you gotta tell a mountain because you gotta cover the first one up. Of course. One line uses the next and the next and the next, and it keeps on growing and growing. That's it. So, you know, that's some her wisdom. Mm -hmm. that passed on to, that those things like that were passed on to me. Uh, she was she, sixth grade education again. But she yeah. was, I was taught that you value the, the, the guy that's homeless on the street as much as you do the person that's in the presidential chair. They are all important. Every one of us is important, whether you're yeah. small or big or short or tall, fat, uh, Echo white. everyone. Yeah. But, you know, the, the other thing is that people do not even know the reason for race. Uh-huh. Every person, don't, why am I black and somebody else is light or white? Because it's a, a, a condition that from the climate you, you originally originated from. Yeah. yeah. If I go to, if I go to Canada, if I go to the North Pole and see a polar bear, uh -huh. He's gonna be white. He's not gonna be black. Yeah, sure. Uh, and and if, if, uh, Snow Fox, he's gonna be white because he would never catch it, catch anything if he, if he was in any other color. Uh -huh. uh, but if I go to the Amazon, I'm gonna find you know, bears, black bears, and brown bears. Yeah. So it doesn't only happen with people. Uh -huh. The Creator made us all in, adapted to the environment that we originated in. Sure. Now, because we got airplanes and trains and boats and cars, we all scramble up and we all over the world and, you know, the world is mixed. Yeah. But if you went back in time, if you go back, and I love to go back in time, because I can see how big uh, societies and empires rose and how they fell. You go back to the Roman Empire, they, you can see that they fell from within. Mm. A, lot of, a lot of countries don't fight war. They end up making too much trouble and they end up being... <laughs> taken over by that. Hitler, at one point, had military power. In World War II, he was the most powerful forces on the earth. Mm -hmm. that, but he made too many enemies. He made an enemy of the United States. He made an enemy of, uh, uh, of uh, Russia. Yeah. He made all types of enemies. And those enemies then devoured him. And so you know, military power is, it should be only used to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. It should not be offensive military power that much. Yeah. If you can defend yourself and you have enough offensive power, the people know that you have it, that's fine. But the, the our budget should be spent more on other things other than military. Yeah, I agree our to budget. that. I agree to that. And our budget should also be spent more on other things other than policemen. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I have nothing. If you say something that seems to be against policemen, it's not because you're saying you may be having a fact that is true and people don't want to see that fact i think the the, uh, the average policeman is worth his weight in gold uh -huh. good, if he's a good and more there's more good cops on the street than there are bad and i'll say that yeah the problem with the good cops is they don't turn into bad cops uh -huh. they let bad cops get away with stuff and so therefore they're tarnished as well uh and and when you say something it, it tears me apart because i want to be someone who cares about the policeman. Yeah. They put their, they put their, their lives on the line every day. I, met, when you, I, I can't imagine being one. Exactly. But then you look around and you see, well, they got 20 young black men shot across the United States in two weeks or something. Why is it always young black men? I got a problem with police because it's always black men and I will always have that problem. Uh -huh. so I try to be honest. Honesty is the best policy. Yeah. Um, 
our images in America are, are kind of wrong in a way. You know, we always uh, uphold what Caucasians or white people do, and we downplay what other groups do. I have a great respect for the American Indian, the Native uh -huh. American. Uh -huh. Every group in, in, that is uh, make up, they have made up America. There's not a group that has not contributed and contributed mightily. Yeah. And yet some people get paid for what they do. And it's like going to work and one, this guy over here, because he got a lighter skin, he gets paid and you don't. That's something wrong with that. That's true. Um, <laughs> and and uh, this is why we are here. When we share our experiences, we share the wisdom passed down by our aunties and grandmothers, like you mentioned in the book. And people get to read that. And uh, we share like uh, this program or others that uh, get to pass along the wisdom. Then that's, that's how we are playing our part. And we thank you for playing your part and uh, bringing us this knowledge, being a historian, letting us know all these things. So I think uh, we've uh, almost come to the end of the show. It's been some time, but we really, really appreciate your presence and uh, you taking your time to come and share with us about uh, uh, your life, about the books. And uh, we look forward to reading. And before we go, where can we get the books? You can, uh, you can get my book on voidbooks.net. Voidbooks.net. We're going to share that uh, on the website or on uh, the video. We are going to share the website so people can go and order the books. This is the road from money. One money. It is also on Amazon. You can also uh, yeah, it's also on Amazon. On Amazon. Yes. The road from money, money. <laughs> and uh, there's a fourth one coming. Uh, well, if, 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 you're yeah. interested, if, you're inter if you're interested in history, yeah. and if you're interested in people, yeah. it, it's, I will say it's a good book to, to read the series, and you'll, you'll find a lot of history, and you'll find a lot of interesting things uh, being stated in the book. Uh, that's, that's, that's very good. And uh, before we sign off, we would like you to leave us with a parting shot. It's something I always ask my guests. Leave us with something you'd like us to keep thinking, even when we are through with this show. Uh, well, uh, my, I was raised as, you know, I always think, just do it. Whatever mm -hmm. it is that you have in your mind, just do it. Because the clock starts ticking at birth. And when the doctor slaps you, and you only got so many quarters, like in a football game, to play the game. Mm -hmm. And try to enjoy it as much as you can make it a great ride and you know enjoy life and smell the roses as you go because my if my aunt used to say dead knows the smell no roses so you gotta smell them while you're alive oh thank you very much that's quite good <laughs> and uh worth living by and uh we really appreciate thank you very much uh, it's been a pleasure sylvester having you on our show. And thank you for all the viewers, those who are watching now and those who are going to watch later. We really thank you. And uh, remember to go to boydbooks.net and get your book. Get your books and also connect with uh, Sylvester. So this is again your host, Anthony Murore, and uh, we are saying bye for now. Thanks for having me. <laughs>